initially, it was 4 o'clock, and uh, we're happy and delighted to have Mr. Steve Wright with us. Some of you met with him before. Who met with him before? No? Okay. So you have... Good strangers. I won't bore them with the same old stuff. Okay. And uh, we are uh, really taking it, and we have Brandon with us. Thank you, Brandon, for coming. And uh, with much ado, I'll uh, leave all the time for Steve Wright and for you. We received some questions from you. He got them, and he will... Uh, Thanks. Um, well, I told you my name, uh, and I see this is a 400 level class, so uh, you're probably going to be job seekers soon, right? Because I, I also noticed there was questions about how do I go about that. So uh, I'll try to cover the questions you had <clears throat> fairly quickly. Some of them are. Uh, Several of you want to know the same thing. I'll try and go through these, and then hopefully those will bring up some other things you want to ask me. So, uh, the first topic was my experience, and and probably my company. But just to give you a little history about myself, uh, if you all been here four years, you know where Oakland is. That's where I grew up. So my. Uh, <laughs> First point of advice or experience is you don't have to leave home to be successful. Uh, my company <clears throat> does about $50 million a year, so we're a good sized business in central Illinois. And uh, I admit I did go to Fort Lauderdale for three years and I hated it, so I came home. So, <laughs> but uh, um, there are questions about uh, my education. I went two years here. And uh, at that time, when we're talking about the 60s, <laughs> um, Eastern did not have an engineering program or this program. Uh, so they had pre-engineering. I went through that, and then I went to SIU um, and got a degree in civil engineering down there. Um, I, a question was, did I have the right education for what I'm doing? I, I do. Uh, the technical education is great. The one thing that they didn't do back then, and I understand that you do get some business courses in this program. Very important if you're going to be an entrepreneur and want to be have your own business. Uh, I knew nothing about it. It took me about 10 years to figure out how to read a financial statement and do cash flow projections and things like that. And it's it's a real disservice, but even then, you know, it was hard to get through engineering school in less than five years. And, and it hasn't become any easier. So, so some business courses would have been quite important. Had, had this program existed, I'd, this is what I would have done because I always wanted to build things. Didn't care about sitting down and figuring out a hydraulic equation. I just uh, liked electric or erector sets when I was a little kid. So, um, As far as getting hooked up with Walmart, in 1980, uh, this company called Walmart that I'd never heard of was bidding a job in Robinson, Illinois. So we asked, wrote to them and asked to be included on the bid list, and they put us on it. And we just got thumped, <laughs> badly beaten. <clears throat> so what we did uh, after after it was being built by our competitor, who was successful. We went down there and watched all the subcontractors that came in and out, wrote down their phone numbers, and pretty soon they bid the old Matt Toon store. <clears throat> well, now we got subs that know how to do them. We called them all. We got Matt Toon. That was our first one. It's 1981. And uh, I'm proud of the fact that since then, I've never not been working on a Walmart, 25 years. So We also do other big box stores, Lowe's, uh, projects you might be familiar with. Of course, we built the Walmart here. 
<clears throat> uh, we did the Home Depot in Mattoon. Uh, we've done some Lowe's around, not nearby. Uh, did two of the Walmart stores in Champaign, Savoy, and then the new one up north. Not Urbana, but Champaign. <clears throat> Before that, the first job Colcon had, uh, we built a loading dock for GE in Mattoon. It was about, I don't know, $18,000 job or something like that. Uh, the Walmarts we do today, <clears throat> depending on size, run from seven to fifteen million dollars. So, but it took thirty years to get there. So, um, the, I'm, I'm, I own all the stock in Colcon. I'm not really an architect. <clears throat> I just uh, we're we're a, one of their one of many contractors. They have about a hundred of us that build them. Their uh, program they're on right now is 400 stores a year. We do five or six of those. Um, but I start out just, you know, like anybody else, and it just sort of grew. I, I told the class I spoke to this morning, <clears throat> I've never been one to do long-term planning. Uh, I'm pretty sure I know what we'll do next week, and, and I got a good idea about next month. But I never had a long-term plan to do anything other than uh, um, organize my company so we could react and be flexible. Because in the construction business, particularly with these, I mean, I can't go down on the square and set up a store and say, come by Walmarts, they're on sale this week. You know, I, I got to wait until a client wants to build. And who knows when that's going to be. So what has happened, particularly over the last five years, we were doing two or three of these a year for 15 years. But they got on a big, this huge building program. Uh, in fact, a vice president of construction came to our office one day, just scared me to death. I thought he was coming to kill us. And wanted to know if we were prepared to, to instead of doing three stores a year for him to do five. And of course we said, sure. <laughs> yeah. And uh, But I've, I've hired people that they think on their feet well, and uh, and they're they're real hardworking because uh, even though we're a fairly big company for this area, I only have 22 employees, so you know there a lot is expected of them. Uh, there's I'm <laughs> since my computer lady retired, I'm the oldest one in the company, and I was only 33 when I started, so I'm 63 now, but. But I've got a couple of people that are, you know, only a year or two from where you're sitting right now. You know, and, uh, so I really have a lot of faith in young people. They're, in fact, I prefer them over somebody that's worked for Kellogg, Brown, and Root, for example, who's one of the biggest, or Bechtel, or Halliburton, because I don't care how they do it. I want you to you know, a prospective employee to learn how we do it and how we can do that big of projects with this few of people. Okay, contracting. It's basically, it seems like uh, Brian and ASAR, is that, is that how you say it? ASAR? Uh, kind of want to know how we went about getting these. We bid every one of them. Uh, the low bidder gets it. There are usually three to five bidders on each job. And uh, I uh, use some of the same examples I used this morning. If you manage to get on the bid list and you beat me a dollar, and I've done a hundred of them, you'd get the job. That's, that's how they are. It, they pre-qualify you. They wouldn't let you bid it if they didn't think you were capable. So if you're the low bidder, you're the contractor. That, that experience means, I mean, it means a lot to them because that's how you get on the bid list. But, you know, it's, it's Colcon, and, which is my company, and three other guys just like us that have done a lot. And whoever's low gets it. And they, they never negotiate. They never try to beat you down. It's just that's the price. So, And, of course, like I say, they're building 400 a year. We do five or six, so there's 
a lot of them being built other places by companies far bigger than mine. So um, you'd ask about how we select subcontractors. Um, we want them to. We're looking for people who have experience with jobs the size of ours. For example, say an electrician. Walmart electrical work will run five to six hundred thousand dollars. We'd like to know that the company we're dealing with has done something that big or near that big. Uh, I know that <clears throat> early in a job you need six electricians, or late you need twelve. Uh, and I've I've watched that dozens and dozens of times. So you know, I'm going to say, can you put twelve people out there for three months? And if they say, well, no, I've only got you know, I've only got nine, and I've got other jobs. Then you probably can't work for us because it's. Uh, I just know it takes that many. We've had people try and do it with less, and then we're screaming at them, and they're working seven days a week to get caught up. So, <clears throat> um, we like you know references from other clients, uh, financial capability. Of course, we we like to. Talk to their bonding company. We like to talk to their banker, the insurance company, because we don't want somebody halfway through can't pay their bills or uh, uh, their insurance gets canceled or something. It's just uh, the the schedules on these things are very tight. From the day we break ground until we hand the store over to them, you know, most of the time it's seven months. Now, occasionally, if we start one in November up here. They'll cut us a little bit of slack because of the winter, but but we just are starting one in in Lincoln, Illinois, right now, and it's it's to be done in uh, uh, first of January. So, and then we uh, my guys stay there about two months after that. The contract completion dates when they start stocking the store, doing their setup, it takes a couple months for that. We stay till grand opening. Once they're open, and we, we usually can leave. So, so it's it's a commitment of about nine months for two people, because I I have to put two superintendents on the jobs. <clears throat> so you know, basically each I've got five sets of superintendents, ten of them total. And, uh, basically, you know, they can do one a year and maybe start a second one. Uh, Aaron asked me what is an average markup. I'm not going to tell you that, <laughs> but uh, um, size of them run from a hundred thousand for a store like one over at Paris, Illinois, to about two twenty-five over five acres. It's all the size of the town and what they see the market as. Uh, almost exclusively anymore, we're building super centers that have the grocery. I think in the last five years I've built maybe one or two Sam's and one or two straight Walmarts, the old dry goods style. So, <clears throat> but mostly they're doing super centers. Um, question about estimating. We still do, uh, while we use technology, we do a lot of manual estimating. Um, I just, and that, that comes from me, and it's, maybe it's because I'm getting old. <laughs> But I just don't believe you can be accurate if you can't, in your mind, put these jobs together as you're going. Not just trust the stylist to say, well, there's X number of lineal feet of something or square feet and, and figure it out for you. <clears throat> now we do, uh, we've built our own uh, compilation program just using Excel to where if because we've done so many, we sort of know, well, okay, the electrical ought to be about this much and the mechanical about this much. So we have numbers early in the estimating process. But as the prices come in, we've got it set up to where we can plug in real numbers that we get from subs, and it'll run it through all the markups and additions and subtractions that need to be done. So it, it makes us very flexible on bid day because most Walmarts bid at 2 o'clock and 90% of our subcontractor prices are coming between noon and two. So we've got a 
get that stuff analyzed and get it in very quickly. Uh, some questions about increases. Um, material increases, I, I would say, is about 10 years, maybe 2% a year average. Uh, then this, uh, Kenneth Pearson wanted to know how much my salary's increased. Well, mine's not very representative because I, I own the store, so um, regardless of what I make, I get to keep the profits. So, But my employees, the uh, way I kind of work it there, we'll hire somebody new, and in six months we'll review them, and if they're doing a good job, they'll get a raise, and then at the end of a year we review again. Um, and I, I have a real generous profit sharing plan. Each year I take 10% of what the company makes and I distribute it amongst the employees. So, you know, even without being told how much I mark things up, we're a $50 million company, there's quite a few dollars flowing through that place, so these bonuses get to be big. Um, my superintendents, uh, probably make $75,000 a year with salary and bonuses. I've got a couple of project managers that will make upwards of $300,000. And, and, and their, their base wage is fifty. dollars It's all commissions, incentives, and uh, so. How would you say that these project managers Well, superintendents are out in the field. Project managers, see, one of the things I do, and this, this is kind of important, Real big companies, they'll have estimators, and then they have project managers. Well, I, my guys do both. And, I, and to me, the project manager, he buys out the job. He uh, sees that these people are told when they need, the contractors are told when they need to be there. Then my superintendents, who are out in the field, monitor that to see that it happens like we've got it planned. I think that's the best way because when you have an estimator, his only job is to get the job for you, which means he does it. He gets the absolute cheapest prices he can, and that's the estimate plus a market. My and the project manager, he's stuck with those dollars, so he really doesn't have any chance to improve it because he's already found all the low prices. Well, what we what we do, and my guys, since they do both. They'll estimate it, and they'll, they'll say, you know, we're in uh, Lincoln, Illinois, and I know there's a great plumber over there that's, you know, worked for us before, and he, and he, can, he can do these for X number of dollars. And, and we're getting prices a lot more than that. So we'll just put in what we know we can buy it for. And then when the guy turns from being the estimator into the project manager, if we don't have a price that's right, he can go to some other people we know, maybe not just the one, and start working with him to see if we can do it. Now, if we use a price to get a job, then we never shop that. If if generally the electrical costs us six hundred thousand, somebody comes in at five fifty, and we put that in the bid, then he's got the job. Because I I believe it to be unethical to take somebody that helped you get the job and then start beating on them. Or chiseling them, you know. So, so I, I don't know if that answers your question about salary increases. I, th the real key at Colcon is to get to be a valuable enough employee that you work your way into these situations. This the supervisor, the superintendents out in the field make thousand dollars a week, but if they get a Walmart done under budget, their bonus for just the job is going to be about $10,000. And their year-end bonus the past few years has been about fifteen, which gets them up around 75000 So, you know, I really try to be generous with them because they're earning, they're earning the money. It's not me. I mean, I, for the most part, I sit in the office or come and talk to classes at Easter. You know, so. Did you get the bonus of 7 Beg your pardon? Did 
Yeah, well, yeah, I've already told you that story. I guy I was working for, I I was a superintendent, and I built a sacrete plant where they make that bag concrete you buy. We got it done about thirty thousand dollars under budget. So it's just extra thirty thousand the guy made, and this is thirty years ago, you know. So and he gave me a hundred dollar bonus, it really offended me. And I swore I'd never do that if I owned a company. So which is why I got to be so generous with with the profits. I never had a, a goal to work till I was fifty five and quit or anything like that. I just I always liked what I do and I've managed to surround myself with people I like working with. I mean uh, you know, I'm Steve to everybody over there. <clears throat> Somebody calls me Mr. Wright, I'm my dad's been gone for years and I still think they're looking for him, you know. It's a so uh and I and I like it that way. It's small, you know, so Uh, you know, I told you, <clears throat> we're there about nine months. I try to, you know, superintendents are there on those jobs five to six days a week, depending on how the schedule's going. They may be as far as 300 miles from Sullivan, Illinois. <clears throat> they get home weekends. Since we have two, what we usually do is one of them stays Saturday and, and uh, then takes Sunday and Monday off and the other one goes home Friday, comes back Monday. Then I have project managers there in the office. They have to visit whichever job the jobs they're responsible for every 10 working days. These are some of these are requirements of Walmart. Some are mine. I try to get out there once a month. Um, and it, it it got to be difficult because we're doing so many. In fact, I, I bought an airplane just so we can travel these things faster. So... We just find the nearest airport and the superintendent comes and picks us up. Furthest one we're doing right now is like out by Springfield, Missouri, which is a six to seven hour drive or an hour and 45 minute flight. You know, so <clears throat> Instead of being gone two days, the project manager can be home at four o'clock. And uh, I'm convinced it saved me hiring some people because it they either stay overnight or get home at three o'clock in the morning and they're worthless the next day anyway because they're pooped you know so so it's it's really been a, a windfall for them <clears throat> we got a topic called uh, administration and uh, Jill you ask the skills you need to be successful uh, probably the most important one is just leadership. That, and, and a lot of that comes from being very knowledgeable about what you're doing so that, so that you can lead with some authority that, you know, look, I know what I'm doing. And, um, you kind of need the ability to negotiate. Um, another great quality is be a good listener. When you've done a lot of these, there's a real tendency to think, well, I know best. Um, and I, I have to admit, you know, early years I was a little bit like, after we'd done 20, I might have thought nobody knows more about Walmarts than me. It's kind of like getting out of college and thinking you know everything there is to know. <laughs> uh, but I've learned you, you got to listen to these people because even if they're not right, they might have one good idea in there. Or sometimes you can pick out something that, that, that they're wrong about and explain that to them why the thing we get into I tell you you know like the six electricians in the 12 10 can't do it you know and I know that because I've watched it I think 97 times now um, and, and you can you can speak with authority and then once you've listened ever heard everyone out you make a decision and, and you got to make the decision. You can't put it off till two weeks from now because meanwhile something's not getting done because you didn't decide. So be decisive, but be knowledgeable. Hear them out, and be willing to be willing to be a leader. Uh, you know, like I say, these projects run anywhere from seven to fifteen million dollars. You're and the project manager ultimately is responsible to that. And I, my project manager's answer. I've got a right hand man. And they answer to him or me. 
that's all. And, uh, you know, their, their assignment is to get them done on time, do everything we agreed to do in the contract, and make us some money. And, uh, you know, as long as they're doing that, they don't get too much criticism from me. But if I go out there and I'm expecting to see electricians that are not there, and he says, well, I'm arguing with them about whether they ought to have five or six, and they're not going to put any on here until we decide. Well, you know, maybe the decision should have been to replace the electrician. Because I'm willing to hear them out, but uh, ultimately the general contractor gets to decide. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and it's hard when you're real young because you're not knowledgeable. You know, I mean... You, you get this great technical education here. And then when, once you go to work, you're going to use some parts of it every day of your life till you retire. And some of it, uh, Dr. Wabi and I were just sitting downstairs talking about history. You know, we both had history classes in school, and it's really enjoyable, with, especially with him, to talk about the pyramids. You know, but. Uh, uh, it really hasn't got anything to do with our work, you know, so your, your, your degree is a real ticket to learn, to be valuable to some employer, me or anybody else. And I, I'm a great advocate of small companies. I, I never had that desire to try to climb the corporate ladder. And uh, a lot of that just has to do with his background of growing up in Oakland and not being real comfortable around big cities and stuff. Um, the hardest thing to control, you know, basically it's the schedule, and there's a lot of things that affect that. It's getting the right number of men there. It's the uh, block supplier didn't get you the blocks when he was supposed to. The rebar shortage because the Chinese are buying all of it. Uh, there's there's all these things, you know. Uh, we can control quality pretty good We because we, we hire good subcontractors, and uh, and then we monitor what they're doing. But you're sort of at the mercy of some of these suppliers. Um, I told the earlier class, one of the things, and, and Walmart's a victim of that too. So what they've done, they weren't getting bar joists when they wanted them. They bought Volcraft, biggest bar joist manufacturer in the world. They weren't getting floor tile when they wanted They bought one of the big tile companies. Uh, I mean, they just, and of course, nobody else can do that. You know, them and Microsoft maybe, <laughs> but uh, uh, they just won't tolerate it. And they won't tolerate it from us. Get it done on time. and uh, Which really kind of boils down to just the ethics you learn here in the Midwest. Do what you said you were going to do. Uh, we use sort of a loose critical path method. We have what we call milestone dates. Um, we use them as a kind of a drop dead date. We're always trying to beat them. There's certain things that, uh, you know, time of year has a lot to do with. We may switch the sequence of something that can be switched so that we can start growing grass, you know, not in December, you know, try and get it started in October or something. But schedule is probably the toughest thing to, to, to monitor. Yeah, no, I mean, we have no control over it. I, you know, I, <laughs> it used to frustrate me, it doesn't anymore. You know, we, what happens is if you lose a week because of wet weather, then you've got to do something. The, the end date never changes. Um, so it means going from five days to six days and going from eight hour days to 10 hour days or whatever. Because we take those completion dates dead serious, as does Walmart. There's a lot of reasons for that. They schedule the delivery of the goods, for initial goods to that store 18 months in advance. Trucks are loaded. I mean, got to be done. So, ah, we had a Aaron and Brian one no key differences. The, uh, seems to me about every three years Walmart 
they evolve these stores. Uh, occasionally, we'll go into a, a metropolitan area. For example, we did one in a very nice section of Louisville, Kentucky, a couple years ago. It's the fanciest one we ever built because the city fathers and demanded something prettier than, than this one. Uh, the little stores in the front of them, the optical shop or the photo shop or whatever, dry cleaner, those are different every time. And sometimes we change them twice. I have actually changed them twice during the construction because some marketing guy said, oh no, there's no optometrist there in that town. Let's get an optical shop or, or there's no dry cleaner. Forget the optical shop. Let's make a dry cleaner out of it. I mean, this happens. And, uh, so uh, the front, the little side issues, those are all leased spaces, by the way. They don't own that. Um, but generally, they're left hand, right hand for some period of time. And then, then they'll have a big change, and we sort of have to relearn. But it, the big change is are usually just in appearance. Square footages have, have been the same for, gosh, five, six, seven years. They're big stores, 225,000 square feet. <clears throat> the, the site is always different. I mean, we've built them on hillsides where we had to blast rock away. We've built them in holes where we had to fill up the hole. And they... <laughs> They don't, we always accuse them of buying the worst site within 50 miles of where they want it. But, uh, and we do what the plans say. Uh, they, Walmart has, there's, the, the whole uh, team, if you will, that builds these, they hire, they've got a few architects. We see four or five, but I suppose maybe they've got 50 maybe around the country. They'll select one of those. They design the building. They hire a civil engineer who designs the site. They'll hire a, a soils engineer to test it, come up with a recommended procedures for the soil. If you got bad soil, you got to lime stabilize it or put fly ash in it or you know, something like that. And then a general contractor. So there's really a <clears throat> several organizations involved. But once it starts, uh, we never have any contact with the architect again. Occasionally we have contact with the civil engineer if we run into something that wasn't disclosed in the soils test, which happens, you know. Um, but, you know, basically it's just us and the Walmart representative. Uh, well, there's another question about the biggest challenge, and I mean, it, it's schedule. Uh, that's the the thing we've got to watch all the time. There are there are issues that are very difficult. Again, I told the other class, Walmart's very concerned about safety. They're very concerned about illegal immigrants. They've been in trouble with the government two or three times over it already. So we have to monitor that kind of stuff. But the big hot button for them is uh, stormwater pollution, which is uh, sediment that gets off a job site. Or uh, you spill a bucket of paint and it gets into the water source. Uh, we kind of had a joke about it this morning, but like the little Jiffy Johns that you put out there on the construction site, we now have to put those in a little tray so that if there's a spill, it doesn't get away. <laughs> you know, so, and, and the littlest things that you would hardly think of, we, we no longer allow, if there's a bulldozer out there, he's got to drive off-site put fuel in it because we don't want to risk spilling diesel fuel on the ground. I mean, it's, it's difficult. And that's not to mention the, the actual erosion problem of when you strip the soil and it starts raining and it's going to create gullies. But we do all kinds of things to control that um, to the tune of three to four hundred thousand dollars on each each one of these stores. That's what we spend on pollution control. Um, 
I've got every every guy in my company, a couple of the gals, have every year I and I go myself. Walmart has a <coughs> stormwater professional training program that you've got to go through every year, and we make out a daily report on the job site uh, that everything's okay. Or we had this problem, and we report at, and then and we have to report on ourselves. And then we have 48 hours to fix it, and then we've got to report that we fixed it. <coughs> um, it's just, and you don't dare sit at home and write it out like you were there and get caught. Walmart considers that fraud. It's justification to cancel your contract. Um, that's the on job every day. Project manager every 10 days, he signs one does the inspection, signs it, and uh, then once a month, the Walmart rep and my project manager or me and our superintendent all get there on the same day and sign one. So they're really monitoring that closely. Um, Yeah. About about getting all those inspections, you mean, or? Well, with city building officials, of course, they'll they'll tell you when they want to look at it, at what stage, and you notify them when you're there. That's the way that is. Walmart shows up whenever they darn well feel like it. <laughs> Um, as does the EPA, by the way. Those are all surprise OSHA. A lot of it, I mean, you just got to be ready every day. They, the construction inspections are easy because they're scheduled, and we kind of control that, and the building officials work with us. One nice thing about working for Walmart is you're usually the biggest deal in town. So everybody, especially in small towns, they're anxious to please. Uh, they got a Walmart, they're looking at those sales tax dollars, you know, and so they want it to go smoothly, <clears throat> but uh, but the others, the government agencies, uh, you know, they're they're allowed to come whenever they want to. Uh, so it's kind of a matter of you you've got to be ready every day. You you can't let this stormwater controls get away from you, and not report them because again, if you get caught, I mean. Over the past two years, I, I know of two of my competitors that what they would do is fail to make a report or fail or do one and not really, they'd give a report but not really do the inspection and then got caught and then just compounded it by trying to make excuses that Walmart fired them and, before, and both of them have since gone out of business. And these are big companies, bigger than mine. But... You know, it's so I, I take all that stuff real serious. And and part of it too is with this four hundred thousand dollars I'm telling you we spend on it, we put it in the budget. They bought it, we owe it to them. And I explain that to my guys. Some of it's silly, putting the Jeffy John in a tray, I mean, you know. But we bid it, they're paying for it, do it. It's a deal, you know, it's that was our deal. We want this. Okay, it's that much, so we owe it to them. You know. and that's just business, you know. And, and again, keeping your word, even though it's written, you know. There's a question about a decrease of work ethic among my employees. Uh, in my uh, my employees, no, my employees have a great work ethic. Uh, out amongst the the subcontractors, see, we really don't have construction workers, if you will, anymore. Uh, it's just too, it's not cost effective to haul a bunch of guys from Sullivan to Marshfield, Missouri, which is from me to you from Springfield, Missouri. So so we subcontract everything. I think probably, yeah, they, they have a lot, of, a lot of trouble with it. Uh, you know, you, you folks are all young, and, but I mean, you're an exception. You're, you're here in college. Uh, you've picked a 
a business, it's not easy because we got to do it out in the weather. Um, and analogy I gave the uh, class this morning: if Walmart could sell their stuff out in an open field, that's what they do. These buildings are expensive. Well, you can't because it's going to rain and snow. Well, maybe a tent. That'd be the next cheapest thing. That didn't work either. So these buildings are just a bother to them. Uh, the retailers, retail part of that business rules Walmart. It isn't the construction department. So, so you, that's something that you always want to kind of remember if, if you get in this business. The goal of whoever you're working for was not to build a building. It was to do whatever it is they do, make widgets, sell buckets if you're Walmart. That's their, that's their goal. It's not to build that building. They're incidental to what they do. It's just a necessary evil. So you kind of got to be aware of your place in the grand scheme of things. To us, that's the goal. Colcon's job is to build buildings. But we need a client that needs a building. And we need to remember that that wasn't the, he didn't build it because he wanted to. He built it because he had to, to do his business. So. Now, this is real important, you guys being seniors. Job opportunities. <laughs> Jill asks, if I, when we hire somebody, what are you looking for? Um, at my place, because we're small, you get hired there, you're probably going to talk to me at some point. I've got a right-hand man. Um, one of the two of us would always talk to everybody. And one of the very first things we're interested in is just your attitude. Um, I like people that are ambitious. I like to know a little bit about your personal goals and a little bit about your background. I'm not, I'm really not real concerned about your grades. I mean, I like to see decent grades, but I'm more impressed by just the fact you made it through because I know you know how to persevere. Things you learn here are because you never learn exactly what you need to know to, to work for somebody. But you do learn to uh, be an organized thinker. You learn where to go to find answers when you don't know them already, which if you didn't learn it in class. Um, I like people that are more interested in what are the, that would ask me, rather than how much are you gonna pay me, uh, how much opportunity do I have here? Um, unfortunately, you read all these <clears throat> uh, going on the internet and say, you know, construction man project manager, and it'll throw some big number out there that has nothing to do with central Illinois. It's got Chicago and New York and all those things rolled in there. So you guys all come out of here thinking, man, I'm going to make all this money. And, and uh, generally, they're my place. Um, We've we've been kind of looking at around you know thirty thousand dollars a year for a starting out, a couple of reviews of first year to get yep something better than that, and then you start getting into these bonus plans I have where within you know most of you are going to be in your early twenties before you're thirty, you know they're at Colcon depending on what job you know you wanted. Uh, Upwards of sixty thousand dollars, and it's kind of the sky's the limit. Now, not everybody's like that. Bigger companies that have a lot of employees can't have these great incentive plans because you can't give a thousand people a big salary, you know. But, but uh, uh, I think everybody likes to hear uh, that you're looking for a job you would like to do in a place you would like to be and have a chance to be very successful financially. But not necessarily that you want to be successful financially tomorrow. You know, you're new hires. It's uh, uh, Some of it comes across, you know, you'll get kids that are real, real well prepared for you. And 
and I say, well, how can I contribute to the company? And I, I'm glad they say that, but I, I'm always a little suspicious because that's pretty uh, far thinking for a young person, you know. Uh, but it's not unreasonable to say, look, I, I don't mind starting cheap, but you know, how do I get where I'm not working cheap? You know, that, that's that's a real important question. And, uh, I think that's a, a good approach to take with any employer. Uh, we don't know anything about you, really. We're just got our fingers crossed, you know. So, I mean, in a rare occasion, I've hired a few sons and daughters of friends where I sort of knew how they'd been raised, and they've all turned out great, you know. But, uh, but generally, we, any employer really doesn't know a lot about you, so we don't want to spend a fortune finding out about you. If you're good, we'll spend a fortune keeping you. Yeah. Um, a couple times we've gotten a pinch. I've hired some uh, experienced older guys that might have been carpenters or uh, maybe have a little bit of education. Anymore, as much as possible, I like to hire young people. I'd like to at least see an associate's degree. Uh, like a bachelor's degree just because it proves more of the same. Um, that's, I, I'd much rather teach you how Colcon does it than hire somebody that's 45 years old that wants to tell me how Halliburton did it, you know, so. <clears throat> I don't know, I guess that, that kind of covers what you guys had specifically asked. What about experience? What about experience? Do you hold a lot of value today? Well, you know, as I said, um, I mean, I know you're not going to have any experience in management, but as far as doing construction. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, it's nice if you know what the terminology means and things like that. Yeah, we're... Sure, that's always a, in fact, that's a, that's a real recommendation. You know, you worked out there as a whatever, laborer, or carpenter, or electrician, uh, decided to go back to school. Uh, you know, I'm not so different than that. I mean, I did four years in the Navy before I went to college. And, uh, I was 28 when I got graduated, so I was kind of behind everybody else, so I, motivated but yeah yeah we're we're interested in experience what I'm talking about like if somebody's being hired as a as a superintendent I would rather put them with one of mine and teach them exactly how we do it than to have to fight with them about well we didn't do it this way over there because basically I we do the same thing we build Walmart stores we build Lowe's we build Home Depot they're big boxes and we're real good at it been successful at it for 25 years and we know how to do that and we want to teach our employees how how we did that how we stayed successful so but sure any experience is great you know uh, summer job work in construction that's great you know but that would that would seldom, if, if I had three uh, applicants, that might tip the scale if ever, everything else was equal. But generally, I, I'm, I think because we've been successful at it, we know how to teach people the way we do it. So your experience maybe give you a head, head start, but, but if it was wrong experience, then it's got to be untaught, you know. So. Yeah. Um, besides invitations to bids, how do you go about searching out bids? Well, with Walmart, which and really all these big companies I talk about, we're we're on their list of preferred bidders. They call us, believe it or not. The first Walmart you did. Oh, the first one. Oh, I like to say we. I mean, honest to God, this nineteen eighty, and nobody heard of Walmart. I checked their credit for God's sake. You know, <laughs> who's Walmart? Uh, 
oh, there's thing, there's publication, there's Dodge reports, there's the newspapers, you know, Walmart particularly, that boy, it's always in the newspaper, here comes the Walmart, so. And I don't even remember, we found out they were in Bentonville, Arkansas, and wrote some blind letter to the construction department, I suppose, you know. Um, we've gotten more sophisticated. When we started working for Home Depot, uh, we started calling them, they've got an office in Arlington Heights in Chicago. Called them, pestered them till they let us bid one. Same thing with Lowe's there in High Point, North Carolina. Yeah. Uh, but once we'd worked for Walmart, we kind of got savvy to how those big organizations work. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Um, this. About the only thing we do anymore, we used to do motels, quite a few motels. Uh, uh, it's just what happened. This building program at Walmart has just ate up my resources. My limited resource is is people. Um, so no, we don't build Walgreens. But, for example, this Walmart here. It's a little strip center. We built that. We have a client in Peoria who, who goes out and finds sites for Walmarts. He'll sell them the site at no profit, what they need of it, so that he can build a strip center next to them because they're such a huge draw. And we've done this one in uh, Danville, uh, Taylorville, Litchfield. We've built a lot of those for that client. Uh, and when there's been some where he's built them and we didn't build them because he, we can, we can only do it if we're there building the store and I can use the same supervisors because I can't afford to tie up a superintendent that can build a $10 million Walmart on a half million dollar strip center. Okay. But that, that's about all the small work we do anymore. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, if, if they quit building, of course I'm getting old enough now, I might just quit, but, <laughs> um, the company probably would go on and but we know how to do the smaller stuff it's a real advantage in order to work for walmart at all now you've got to have averaged 25 million a year for five years so it really eliminates a lot of the competition the competitors we have are tough because they're just like us they've done a lot of them but you're not competing with guys who really don't know what they cost so they might put in a low number that was, it might break them, but they would get the job, you know, so. But mostly big now, big like that. And my ambition's never been to build skyscrapers. Three stories, about as big as we've ever gone. Yeah, so. You had another one? Yeah, um, as far as contracting contractors and paying contractors, how do you go about that? You do like the whole, just contract the whole job? Well, bits, bits and pieces. I mean, we'll hire a plumber, plumbing contractor, electric contractor. Um, you know, they'll give us a price to do the work. If it works, fits in our budget, then they can. Like at the end of the, when it's done or. Oh, no. No. Um, we start work. Let's just say we start on the first day of the month. We bill Walmart on the 25th day of the month. So we work 25 days, as do they. They give us a bill, we give Walmart a bill. Walmart will pay us by the 25th of the following month. Once I get that check, and it's standing rule around my place, we pay the subs the next, we write checks Tuesdays and Thursdays. If I get money on Wednesday, well, we can't get it run through by Thursday. But you'll get, and you're my sub, you'll get yours on Tuesday. I don't, I don't hold other people's money. Uh, and I'm a good collector. But Walmart, as all the bad stuff you hear about them, all these years they've, I've found them to be absolutely dead on fair. They pay me on time. They expect the job to be done on time and they want the quality they've paid for. But, and they're very, they're very demanding and they're tough. But they don't, they don't mess around with your money. They pay you on time. Yes. Well, 
Well, <laughs> they in the contract it says if we're done early, we get fifteen hundred dollars a day. If we're done late, we pay a thousand. I've never had a bonus, and I've never paid any penalties because they're the only decider. Uh, the worst penalty about being late for Walmart is you don't get a bill anymore. Um, and you got to put things in perspective. We're talking about multi-million dollar jobs, $1,500 a day if you're done early on a job that it's darn hard to get done in the time they gave you. It's uh, If you worked overtime to get it done early, you're going to spend more than $1,500 a day. Uh, so I, I never take those into in 30 years of this, I've had one bonus, got it from Lowe's. And it wasn't for being done early. They had a site contractor who went belly up on them, and we took it over and finished it cheaper than they were going to pay, and they gave us $15,000. That's it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really not even a consideration. Three o'clock. Look at that. Any questions or comments? Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome.